morning everyone welcome to this very important online media workshop on how the renewable energy situation is in karnataka right now and we have a, an excellent galaxy of speakers to tell us journalists about this and please have your questions ready and type them in in the q and a box so that our moderator arti khosla from climate trends can take it from there and after the talks are over after the presentations are done if you want to ask questions uh, through the audio please go ahead and do that raise your hand and i'm sure the moderator will be happy uh, to have everybody participate uh, it's a workshop it's meant to be totally participatory i don't want to take up any more time you know that india climate dialogue and the earth journalism network have been organizing these very focused state specific media workshops on renewable energy situation we have organized one on maharashtra we have work, organized one on tamil nadu and this is the one on karnataka once the presentations are done i will tell all my colleagues all my journalistic colleagues some more initiatives that we are taking to improve the coverage of renewable energy issues all over the country especially these states very especially karnataka there are story grant opportunities that i will talk about so please stay tuned for that and right now what i am going to do is to first request my colleague sapna gopal to very quickly take you through three or four slides on what the re figures in karnataka are right now after which we shall hand over to the moderator arti sapna over to you yeah sure thanks uh, joydeep and a very good morning to uh, all uh, our audience and our esteemed speakers uh, i'm just uh, quickly uh, giving you a little bit of so we are as everybody knows uh, we are speaking about uh, renewable energy in uh, karnataka so we are going to deliberate on the issues and the way forward uh we will be focusing primarily on um, solar and wind energy so just a few graphs to give us the numbers so this is the uh, installed uh, power capacity and the figures have been uh, as you can see uh, provided by uh, central electricity authority and very interestingly uh, you know it says that renewable this is in percentage so renewable energy is like occupying 51% which is extremely impressive and then there's a uh, hydropower which is 12% followed by thermal 35% and nuclear 2% so uh, this is the uh, installed uh, power capacity and then we go on to the uh, so this is a comparison when we look at uh, the country uh, and uh, this is um, figures which have been released by uh, mercom india which is again a clean energy consultancy and again if we look over here amongst all the other states you know uttar pradesh is a huge state maharashtra rajasthan uh, despite a very impressive figures in terms of solar energy over there karnataka leads in terms of the cumulative installed uh, utility scale uh, solar projects and karnataka has got an impressive 24% so that is like a huge jump and then we go on to the wind power installation by states now uh, traditionally uh, karnataka has not been a wind power generating kind of a state it's always been tamil nadu and there's some amount gujarat but despite all that it's sharing uh, an incredible 13% it's very impressive with a state like maharashtra when it comes to uh, wind power installations so uh, this uh, the cumulative wind power installation was uh, of the country was 37.7 gigawatt and these figures are as of march 2020 and uh, in a, a recently uh, 
Karnataka announced that uh, you know it aims to achieve a minimum capacity addition of 6,000 megawatts by 2022. So that is like a, a huge, huge figure. And uh, then uh, these are the figures which were provided to us by KREBL. Uh, this shows the progress of wind power uh, in Karnataka, and uh, this is as on January 31st, 2021. So these are the figures, allotted capacity, the commission capacity, the cancelled capacity, and the balanced allotted capacity, which is to be commissioned. And uh, similarly, we also have uh, solar energy. Again, the cumulative progress of solar power in Karnataka, again, as on January 31st, 2021. So this in a very briefly are a few of the figures and few of the graphs, uh, which kind of, uh, you know, capture what exactly is happening more in terms of solar and wind energy in Karnataka. Over to you, Joydeep and Aarti. Thank you so much for this. Uh, hi, thanks, Sapna. So uh, if you uh, will stop sharing your slides now, please. Thanks. Uh, and I'm going to just hand over to the moderator of the day, Aarti Khosla, the head of Climate Trends. Uh, many of us know her one of the top RE figures in the country today. Aarti, over to you. Thank you, Joydeep, very much and very good morning to all of you. Thanks, Sapna, also for taking us uh, through the Karnataka numbers and setting the context quite well. Uh, Joydeep, can I check? Do we have about 40 minutes to do this? We have more. Just let's do it, it. Uh, 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 yeah, on the basis Understood. of what, what, uh, merits, yeah? Understood. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, uh, we have a panel and we will go with the speaking order, but I think there are a couple of things, you know, which came out quite evidently from Sapna's slides and uh, it will be nice for each of the panelists to focus on, uh, you know, how the, the entire energy transition for the state of Karnataka is shaking out, so to speak. I think the slide showed quite evidently that renewables is nearly double of coal in the state. Karnataka is also one of the good states which possibly don't have uh, any new coal plant. And it becomes quite important at a moment, especially today when, you know, in a state like Tamil Nadu, the prime minister is still inaugurating or commissioning uh, a new coal plant, uh, uh, you know, which is also, uh, which could have been renewables, uh, but, 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 but that's what, uh, you know, the neighboring state is going to uh, to do today. Uh, regardless, um, you know, uh, Karnataka clearly, and most of you have been following this more than me, but Karnataka has been taking advantage of several renewable energy policies. It started fairly early. Uh, there are things to be discussed in terms of what are the implications of, you know, the progressive nature of the state and what it has done on renewables and possibly not just focus on what Karnataka policies mean for renewable expansion for the state itself, but hopefully are there any lessons to be learned for other states to follow? Because clearly, um, you know, with the embarkation of 450 gigawatts by 2030 and the enormous and massive target that India has set out for itself, the implications are going to be massive. And it feels uh, in the helicopter vision, if you take, there is still going to be a lot of coal in the energy mix. There is going to be an uh, an enormous increase in renewables, but uh, uh, you know, trying to trying to come at some level of where in the electricity sector will uh, will renewables gain so much ground that there is a good inflection point, and we are really not looking at a transition where coal remains a significant part of the system. I think it will always remain a part of the system for two to three decades. That's what the modeling that uh, some of uh, the organizations present here, uh, like WRI and C-STEP would possibly know more about, but I just wanted to mention, you know, that this might be a useful context if you feel to have the discussion, uh, you know, that, that we will have in the next uh, one hour or so. Uh, we have uh, we have an eminent panel, as Joydeep said. We have uh, I will at least introduce the panel to you, and then we will invite them to share their opening remarks and uh, try to have a moderated discussion to also include comments and questions and uh, uh, inputs that uh, participants might have. But first, uh, let me please introduce uh, our panelists. We have with us today Mr. Kapil Mohan. 
Mr. Kapil Mohan is the principal secretary and chairman of uh, Bescom, uh, as well as uh, uh, the power the power company of Karnataka uh, Limited, which I understand is also the owner of uh, some of the largest coal plants uh, in the state. Uh, welcome to you, Mr. Kapil Mohan. We also have uh, Harish Hande. Uh, Mr. Harish Hande uh, needs less introduction. Has not just been uh, a pioneer of last mile energy connectivity, so to speak, uh, you know, but I think there is also a big story that Harish can tell on empowerment and equity and uh, very uh, warm welcome to you, Harish, and like always look forward to hearing your insights and perspectives. We also have uh, Mr. Shopta Ghosh, who's the group leader for renewable energy and the energy efficiency program at the Center for St uh, Study of Science, Technology and policy C-STEP as it's called. Uh, C-STEP has done a lot of work helping the, the, the Karnataka government on uh, several issues, I'm, uh, I, I believe, including, you know, the, the uh, how do you say, the, the DISCOM financial crisis and the studies that they have done there. And I look forward to hearing from uh, you as well, uh, Shopta. Welcome. Uh, and we have uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar Hanikonda, who is uh, heading the energy program at World Resources Institute, as some of you know, WRI in India, as well as across the world have been engaged with uh, government and uh, senior level decision makers and proposed several policies and interventions which uh, scale up climate action. And to that extent, uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you, Ashok, uh, as well. Uh, may I now uh, just start with uh, Mr. Kapil Mohan. Can you hear us? Uh, Mr. Mohan, and is this is is the audio working? Yeah. Good morning. Hi. And good morning. Uh, good morning. I am Paramesh, yes. joint director. Uh, Kapil Mohan sir is busy. Uh, he is with the CM. I hope so he will not be uh, attending, and we will be here. My director technical no is here. Yeah, my director technical will be here. Uh, any moment. Who will be speaking uh, from uh, from Bescom and KPCL side? Would you be able to take the floor at this moment, or can I come back when your director technical is? Uh, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that would be better. That would be better. So no problem. Be but we'll be okay. Okay. Uh, we will come back uh, to BESCOM in a little while, but uh, then Harish, may I invite you first? And, you know, like I said already, there is enough that you could talk about how, you know, the work that you have done has been a model in technology and finance, what is needed. The government itself is putting a lot of emphasis on utility scale, but there is a clear role to be played on tailored energy solutions, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis how the, the energy policy in overall is looking. I know that you will focus on Karnataka, but my question to you is, what would you like to say about the importance of these tailored and you know, last mile solutions and uh, what role do they have to play in the broader renewables as an important part of the energy mix in the state? And if you can also uh, uh, overall in the country, uh, take your time for about eight to 10 minutes. So the floor is yours. Yeah. Thanks, Arthi. Uh, wonderful to meet you. Yeah. Uh, it's been a long time that we've not met with the e-meeting to both of you, I think. Um, but yeah, so I, I before uh, before I share the slides, I, I, I hate showing slides, but uh, but but let me let me go to the brass tags, right? And uh, the issue is we we need to reframe the way we discuss renewable energy. We should actually somewhere stop talking from always from the supply side. And we should relook at what the demand side is. And rather than always about supply trying to then fit a demand, relook at what demand is and what's otherwise we as a state of Karnataka or as a nation, we will lose out our opportunity to be a leader in the world as far as renewable energy is concerned. It's not about the statistics of how much renewable energy do we are we producing, but the statistics should be how many people are using renewable energy directly. And, and the beauty of renewable energy is it's been the decentralized nature of renewable energy. Because the moment we talk about centralization of renewable energy, we will go back to the old issues what the grid actually faced. I mean, grid was great for a certain time frame, 
and certain generation and certain philosophy just like telecom but moment you talk about renewable energy united states is actually going towards decentralization germany is going towards decentralization in many ways we have to rethink when we are 40% of the population or 50% of the population whom we define as poor have a wonderful opportunity to us to relook at renewable energy as a development game a development game that will lead to innovations of livelihood products like rice mills high efficient rice mills water pumps silk weaving machines blacksmiths etc etc high quality high efficient vaccine refrigerator cold storage systems that is required for development and income generation to reduce poverty and where the sustainable energy actually plays a fantastic role and especially in a sense in the pandemic what happened was when the centralized systems of supply chains collapsed when lot of the people moved back when lot of the supply chains for their materials collapsed it was renewable energy decentralized renewable energy that helped people to get back on their feet whether they were poor farmers whose vegetables were rotting to rice grain to threshers to swap collection centers in the rural areas it was decentralized energy that actually saved the day and that actually led to more of the innovations to happen and that karnataka that's the untold story of karnataka in many ways the beauty of karnataka is not the statistics of renewable energy that has scaled up the beauty of karnataka is that there are numerous models of renewable energy and how many of would people would know that karnataka was the first state in 1994 to introduce the concept of financing for renewable energy when malaprabha gramin bank in darwad started financing for solar in 94 95 it became the first bank in the world when tungabhadra gramin bank which was based of bellari started livelihood opportunities in 97 looking at solar and sewing machines way back in 97 even without looking at subsidies and if you look at the numerous villages where people use solar and have actually paid for it not say ki mere ko government ke subsidy chahiye mere ko chahiye they actually have paid there are more than a million households in rural karnataka running on solar power financed by sk rd rdp the uh, the microfinance based out of dharmasthala itself finances 40000 systems on a on a yearly basis for livelihood applications where renewable energy is actually taking a grassroots level movement and if you look at arti from an indian perspective it's the 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 way we should position ourselves as a leader not as a leader saying that we are using renewable energy but we are a leader of providing solution for the african countries and the south american countries and indonesia and philippines is that how do i look at agriculture and renewable energy in somalia because i have succeeded in manipur i have succeed i means as a country we have succeeded in manipur you have succeeded in central madhya pradesh those solutions can be then be replicated in ethiopia can be in indonesia we don't become like the chinese where we become another trader of panels trader of batteries traders of windmills we have to be where i go to india because i will get solutions do you know in the last one year before the pandemic the numerous visitors from ethiopia from sierra leone from tanzania who have actually come to karnataka and seen those rural solutions can i then replicate and all of them were rural uh, solar powered do you know that's the story of ari the ari is not from a demand side how many megawatts are been used how many millions of people are actually using should be the story and what do they need they need two lights four lights six lights eight lights cooling solution so that the vegetables don't get rot i need livelihood applications running on silk weaving everything or a blacksmith blower that's what we need to talk about renewable energy and that's the development game that as a as a state we need to play that game as a country we need to play that game we should not start looking at statistics from a supply side because that's a very skewed way of looking at renewables because even large solar needs lot of water where do i do cut sustainability in that case once we start looking at decentralized fashion we truly look at holistic development education health everything else in one gamut can i quickly show the slides i don't know whether the, uh, one of the moderators is showing the slide just to give you an example and this is from a state of karnataka where karnataka and kalahandi and in manipur how the three are connected and that is how we bring in lot of youngsters from manipur from kalahandi into karnataka and 
help them actually unlearn some of the other stuff, but also about how do you link sustainability and development. And now if you go to one of the poorest states of poorer parts of Odisha or remote parts in the border areas of Manipur, how solar is being used from a development perspective and not from a supply perspective. Arti, do you have it or somebody else has it? Sorry, Harish, sorry, I, I missed I, I, yeah, I, I, uh, Sapna, no, will no, you share the slides, please? D D Sapna, do you have the slides from Harish? Because I don't have them. Okay, so if you have them, Harish, if, if, if you could Harish, share. can you email them to me now? Sorry, I don't have them, but okay, 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 okay so, sorry. Uh, or if you could just share from I'll share, it, I'll share it. Yeah. I'll share it. I'll share it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Same, huh? So my question is, if you look at Karnataka and if you break it up into rural, urban and tribal, and the tribal is an Odisha photograph and the rural is a Karnataka photograph, all these applications can be actually provided with so or renewable energy in a very sustainable manner where many of them can skip the whole paradigm that we need to supply them with grid electricity and creating an enormous hole into the state expenses by providing solar the expenses that the state loses in whether transmission losses or loses in actually not being able to collect, that money is valuable for health and education. We actually save using sustainable energy um, for other development uh, scenarios. If you look at the top left, it's a, it's in part of Bel uh, in parts of Bellari where silk weavers are using solar powered uh, silk weaving machines where instead of doing four to five uh, items on a daily basis now they do eight to ten reducing the surgery making them gender sensitive and inclusive so that a lot of women entrepreneurs have come in the bottom left is a blacksmith blower who used to actually use the old type of fans to actually uh, make the heat uh, uh, viable now use a solar powered fan behind and the control is in his hand and he able to increase his productivity by 50% and then equivalent. And all of these have taken bank loans. They are not subsidized. The pottery maker, the beauty of solar is that Arti, it actually equalizes gender. And all the people who, who know how to run a rice mill to a G, uh, using diesel need a strength to actually open up the, the uh, to run the diesel. Now in a pottery making, the main complaint is the drudgery. Now there's a solar power powered pottery making where both men and women are able to increase their productivity on a day. Same thing, the left, the hammer mill, a solar powered hammer mill actually infuses gender. And that's the beauty of DRE. It is so inclusive. It's money saving. It is earning money earning rather than looking at savings it earns. The rice thresher on the right or a sewing machine in, 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 uh, in Hubli Dharwad or the rice mill in way back in Mysore. This is in the BR Hills, a medical unit that's, that also became a, a swap collection center. Uh, this is the same got replicated from Karnataka into rural Kalahandi, a Xerox printer shop, which now completely runs where instead of paying 200 rupees for the bus to go and take up simple Xerox, the people spent five to 10 rupees. You've created livelihoods, you've reduced the earning, um, the expenses for the tribals, you have created a sustainable system that he no longer needs any sort of grid. So we don't need to fight whether it's solar or not. A, a dental chair. How do you democratize the delivery of health? How do you how do we take services to the people rather than the poor people spending enormous time to come to centralized hospitals? Can we take and that can happen because DRE exists. Same thing in education. Many of the rural paper, rural places, solar powered internet education was very valuable during the pandemic. Same thing. We got the. We, we, uh, this is a African delegation from Tanzania, which actually came and and spent some time in Mysore, Hassan, and in Odisha. And now they are creating. And in the, the right hand side below is Darwad uh, Livelihood Center in in Darwad. Are now trying to replicate similar option in Tanzania. And so what I'm trying to uh, say, the uh, Arti and and my other esteemed guests, is that we have today a wonderful opportunity to showcase to the world solutions from ARI that actually leads to development. And that debate will be lost if we keep only talking from a supply perspective. And we need to look at demand, development, sustainability, future, and poverty reduction, and going towards the SDG goals of 2030. Arti, over to you. 
Thanks very much, Harish. And like always, hitting the nail on the head and I, everything that you said makes a lot of sense. Uh, we will go on to the next panel, but I just wanted to, you know, observe some of the things that you said. And if there is time, maybe come back to it because it feels if you look at, um, you know, the way the uh, the renewable expansion is happening, that the train has pretty much left the station in terms of expanding utility scale. What you're saying is very valid in terms of, you know, how the renewable story itself should be decentralized. But for example, with the central government's focus on large utility plants, Karnataka itself, I think the Pavagar plant is the largest in the country or the world. So, you know, it's a paradox in itself of the state, the kind of stories that you have shown and the, you know, the, the, the impact of how solar is really like the rural solar nexus is the best thing that can play out for a country. But at the same time, there is massive amounts of large utility deployment as well. So somewhere you have to, I think somewhere we need to be able to rationalize on what is actually happening in the real economy and what is our vision. But I do take your point that it's absolutely important for at least people like us to keep underscoring and pushing for decentralized and at least we will get halfway to where we would not have gotten even otherwise. And I think that that remains really the the point you made a very nice point about removing drudgery and um, you know which could have been the fundamental of how to push decentralized as well and uh, quite uh, separately you know what comes to mind is how the pm really talks about the you know the lpg and the ujwala scheme and like the the benefits of that are also to remove drudgery and i wonder you know if if the pm mission can actually be about a certain aspect of decentralized uh, solar with with the aim of you know just making lives of people better, lives of women better, because uh, there are several pros and cons of how people also look at Ujwala, but all in all, it is sure. an effort to make the lives of people better on a day to day, but maybe, you know, we can come back to it and uh, thanks for, for, for sharing your first comments. I will move on to... Uh, Arti, I just uh, quickly wanted third, to but add may something. I first, Somya, please go on. Uh, you know, the, uh, I see India Climate Dialogue will soon be running a whole series of articles on DRE, you know, which is why I got really excited by what Tarish was saying. And it will look at the various aspects of uh, decentralized renewable energy. So I will ask all the panelists, to uh, all, the, all the participants to keep an eye out, eye out in the next uh, few weeks. We'll be running a series of articles. We've already planned about six and more will come in. May I as well check at this moment if uh, the BESCOM colleagues are there to speak as well? Uh, may I check with you, Mr. Kapil Mohan's office? Not yet. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. I am Paramesha here, I am Giant Director and uh, later my ACS will be joining. Uh, before that I would like to, uh, you know, state some important things happened in the RE generation in the state. Uh, we are the uh, uh, prime runners in RE uh, facilities. So I think before 2015 we had only 2000 megawatt of RE per injected into the grid. As of now, we, are on, we have 18,000 megawatt of RE, including uh, the hydro generation. Uh, in this, uh, hydro generation is something like 4,000 megawatt, including the mini and micro hydro. And uh, the RE, the two with uh, wind and solar, we have around 15,000 megawatt. And we have a situation here uh, when the generation from RE is more than that of the uh, load of the state. Uh, for a given particular day, uh, we have seen more than 7,000 megawatt being injected into the grid, whereas we had the loads of uh, load ranging from 6,000 to 6,500, and we have found it very, very difficult to balance the grid without uh, taking any uh, thermal generating station uh, schedules. The grid operators have uh, strived hard to maintain the grid and also 
to control the area control error it was very very difficult for the grid operators so such is the scenario here uh, but we still continue to support the re generation and uh, we are exploring certain uh, mitigating solutions like uh, battery solu battery energy storage uh, solutions as well as uh, pumped hydro storage solutions i think uh, by another 5 6 years we will be having a pumped hydro storage uh, solution uh, from sharavati generating station uh, 2000 megawatt and we are we are also coming out with a standard bidding document uh, we are calling for the uh, proposal from the private uh, uh, entrepreneurs for 1000 megawatt uh, pumped hydro storage uh, with this i think we will be in a position to balance the grid and uh, Uh, observe all the re generated in the uh, state because re ha has must run status we have to observe it we have almost uh, 11500 megawatt ppa with the discounts whether we use it or not we have to pay the uh, charges charges that is the energy charges to the uh, re generators that is one thing apart from this we have another scenario which is very very important and uh, uh, which is really pinching the pockets of the distribution companies is the backing down of the thermal generating stations where we are forced to back down or uh, run the thermal generating station at uh, technical minimum so as to balance the grid balance the variance of the re generation Uh, in that uh, aspect we are losing heavily on the fixed charges even though uh, we have the declared capacity available we are not utilizing the energy but we are made to pay the fixed charges that amounts to be very very high and if you look at the uh, overall scenario of the state our energy charges are increasing day by day because of this aspect of the paying of fixed charges otherwise the competitive rates of the re it has come below 3 rupees even though it has come below 3 rupees it is not serving any purpose the on the other side it is increasing the cost of the thermal generation generating stations so this is one aspect which is uh, uh, hurting the entire state and uh, we are having lot of uh, problem with the financial even the cash flow problems all those things for the distribution companies and we are trying to have some uh, solution for this uh, and the load is not picking up even the demand by the uh, industries is not picking up as we have thought of even though we have uh, envisaged around 5 to 6% it is only at the rate of around 4% uh, this is another concern where the demand is not increasing in proportion to the generation added and the fixed charges are increasing which is ultimately increasing the cost of the energy for the end consumers uh, regarding the policy uh, for uh, grid scale uh, generation and other things we are uh, supporting the re uh, re injection into the grid as per the uh, prime minister's uh, 175 gigawatt by 2022 policy as well as uh, maybe 460 gigawatt by 2026 or 2030 uh, we are coming out with a re policy if the draft is draft is ready in which we are uh, proposing to support repowering of wind uh, projects encouraging re solar wind uh, hybrid projects uh, of course we are going to have three very big parks uh, we have been thinking of having around 2500 gigawatt uh, uh, sorry 2500 megawatt each uh, solar uh, solar wind hybrid projects uh, projects in uh, coppal bidar and gadag so it, it will be connected to the isds network uh, as of now around 600 megawatt has been uh, tendered in such places and also we are going to have one more solar park in pirozabad in gulbarga where we have a land uh, to an extent, uh, extent of around 1500 uh, acres uh, which was uh, earmarked for thermal generating stations earlier Uh, now the thermal generating station is not being encouraged we are going to have a solar park there uh, around 500 megawatt solar uh, uh, park so it will be facilitated by uh, our nodal agency kerli dl next is uh, we are also uh, proposing to support 
the floating uh, solar generating uh, stations uh, solar generating stations and the development of ari park uh, in different places i i just want Storage to make one point here uh, is that uh, as mr hande was telling hari sande was telling i think uh, the decentralized uh, karnataka was a pioneer in uh, uh, taking up the decentralized the grid scale, grid scale uh, generation from solar every taluka we have uh, planned around uh, 20 megawatt uh, solar plants around 2000 megawatt is spread over in different uh, taluka levels <clears throat> wherever we had the substation near to the uh, near to the substation we have uh, installed the solar plants and uh, as of now around we have 7500 megawatt of wind gener uh, solar generation happening and uh, still more uh, solar pl plants are being uh, planned so this that's all from us any questions are there we will be very happy to answer thanks Thank very much sir i'm sure there will be uh, a lot of questions but maybe i ask two three things just for clarification uh, i think first of all the point that you have made is quite well taken that despite the fact that renewables have shown deflationary pricing and the costs have come down thermal generation costs are still becoming difficult to deal with and i think the point really that you made on how grid balancing i think should be the thing to invest in so if we can come back later then maybe talk a little more about grid balancing and what needs to be done there uh, my other question to you was you mentioned floating solar uh, is that correct did you say floating solar as well yeah yes floating solar we have a capacity identified 7500 megawatt uh, installable uh, area available in the dam site as well as some lakes and others that has been identified even kpc is planning to start with this uh, floating solar only only thing is cost cost is i think it will it will be double that of uh, whatever solar we are talking on the which is ground mount correct and my last question to you and of course there will be more but for now uh, you mentioned about gulbarga as well and you know that project has been on the books for a while but i understand has not been commissioned did you say that due to difficulties in setting up a new thermal power plant the status is that now gulbarga will be more renewable based sorry i missed no, that one it is not for not because of any difficulty or anything like that uh we have a special purpose vehicle uh, established uh, by name pck power company of karnataka uh, which was supposed to help the capacity addition of addition uh, for the, the generation uh, in addition to the whatever kpc was doing kpcl was doing and during that period i think it was in 2008 9 we have purchased a land uh, in gataprabha Uh, 1500 acres of land and we wanted to have a thermal generating station but the scenario has changed now after 2015 the scenario has changed nobody is going for the thermal generating station as you know kurgi generation generating station in uh, bijapur it was proposed to be proposed to have 8 in, uh, 5 into 800 megawatt only 3 into 800 megawatt has been installed and now the ntpc is planning to have re generation in that uh, remaining land so this prompts us to go for re generation rather than going in for thermal generation which is a fossil fuel uh, based one and uh, also to add add uh, for this uh, i think uh, everybody knows about this there is another 220000 megawatt of stranded capacity in the country which is not being utilized Uh, coal generation uh, standard capacity so with all those things i i don't think anybody will support the uh, construction of the thermal generating stations even umrpp uh, and uh, umpp plants have also been uh, shelved uh, we are not having br umpp and odisha umpp and even chayur which was uh, supposed to come up uh, did not take up so this shows that the thermal generation is not getting any encouragement as of now uh, that is why we thought that we will go for solar generation in gulbarga hope i have answered great thanks very much yes you did and i think uh, 
uh, well, if the participants knew of this before, that's good. But at least from how I'm looking at it, that's absolutely very forward looking and progressive. And it's also just the better and the economically viable option, not just in the long term, but also in the medium to short term. And I think the point that you made about, um, you know, the stranded assets across the country are also extremely well taken. And uh, there is greater cognizance that renewables are expanding, not just because, you know, they they are an alternative, but clearly they are mainstream now. It's not just, you know, renewables as an alternative. And during COVID times as well, we saw, especially because of the must-run status, uh, the, the generation from renewables uh, every day was getting, you know, was increasing. And that was a, a good thing to see. Maybe we will come back when there are questions uh, later, and I hope you will still be online. Uh, thanks for your comments. Sure. Can I, to you? Thanks very much. Can I come to you, um, uh, Shoptak, and uh, you know uh, the work that C Step has done with the state, uh, the program that you are part of, and the interventions that you have taken, uh, not just uh, you know to to suggest how the state could clean its debt through the Uday scheme. What is your view on? Uh, you know the how how the energy transition in the state is playing out in light of comments that have just been made as well. Thank you, Arti. Um, so it's a difficult stage to take up once Rockstar Harish Hande has already spoken about everything. So we echo his sentiments, and uh, we'd like to uh, show what C Steps' perspectives on uh, the RE situation in Karnataka is and what our contributions have been. I'll just share my screen here. So as we saw that like, we have already crossed our target of seven or six gigawatt today because we already have 7.4 gigawatts of solar with Pavagara being one of the largest in the world. And as Sir mentioned, we were planning to have two and a half gigawatts each in Bidar, Gadag and Kopal. Wind is a bit uh, laggy along with rooftop solar with only 0.5 gigawatts there. And uh, the thing about uh, Karnataka is because it receives some of the highest uh, radiation profiles in this country, Although we uh, achieve our target, uh, we, it is our responsibility to contribute more and more in RE with respect to the whole country. So for that purpose, not just in uh, the large scale solar, we've also focused a lot on decentralized RE as well. So this is one of the tools that we have to help developers or government plan uh, solar, large solar or wind in the state. This is the RE Atlas or the Darpan selection profile. So if we check, uh, we can go to any of these uh, districts in Karnataka on this tool, and we can go and find out what are the ideal places where you can put solar power. So all these uh, red mark areas that you see, these are all solar parcels, which we have identified, and these have been classified as uh, wastelands by the remote sensing and uh, skate application centers across the state and the country. So if you click on any of them, you can go and see that uh, you can install around eight megawatts in only one square kilometer. And like this, you can go to any district of Karnataka and any taluk and go and figure out which are the possible locations in which you can put solar. And these are uh, selected through a multi-criteria process where we say that the minimum radiation profile should be this much, the distance from the nearest substation road and rail network should be less than three kilometers, and uh, the slope of the land should be in such that it should support solar panels to less than 4%. So while we figured out that these technical constraints matter, there are also a lot more other constraints such as uh, livelihoods and ecological impacts. So we are working now with the Nature Conservancy, Vasudha Foundation, and Foundation for Ecological Soci uh, Security to f see not just the technical aspects, but also the ecological and social impact assessment before we choose or uh, suggest any site for RE development. So that's, that tool is called SiteRight, and that has already been launched for a few states, and we're working on Karnataka as well. But having said that, so al although we are supporting the government in all the ways possible to for these large-scale solar plants and wind plants, our focus is now on the decentralized yari because big is not always the best according to us 
And as uh, Hande sir said, we should always try to first look at demand and try to match solar or wind accordingly there. The primary reason be, uh, is that when you have a two gigawatt solar park in Pavagara functioning and suddenly a cloud or a microclimatic conditions lead to any cloud cover, then the generation drops drastically and essentially we don't have the balancing or scheduling mechanism where coal can be ramped up very quickly to match the demand at that point of time. That is one. The other problem is that if you have uh, large solar parks, then you need to have dedicated infrastructure like the transmission network to take it out, which lay unutilized for more than 15 hours a day because solar generates only seven hours to eight hours a day. So that's a, these are all external costs which are associated along with the fact that the thermal costs are rising as energy department has already mentioned. So Credil and Karnataka have always been very proactive with respect to these uh, aspects of large and trying to go decentralized. So they already have a restriction on the maximum solar that can come up in a taluk and that has allowed us to focus more on uh, the agricultural aspects of solar and on rooftop solar. So based on that, we will show what our work in rooftop solar has been. So what we do in rooftop solar is that we have uh, taken a helicopter and we flew across the whole of the city of Bangalore and mapped out the entire potential of the city on a per rooftop basis. And this we did using a shadow assessment at a five centimeter resolution because when it comes to rooftop solar, even because we're talking about kilowatts, even if you lose 0.5 kilowatt in a four kilowatt system, thanks to shadow, your entire business case goes for a toss. So I'll show you a small demo of the tool. And uh, now based, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Sheila ma'am, who was earlier in Bestcom and now she's been promoted to the energy department as, and congratulations ma'am. So most of our work in rooftop solar with Bestcom has happened with her mentorship. So we can only really grateful for that. And this tool that we talk about, the tool that we developed using uh, LIDAR and uh, it's called Crest. I hope you can see the screen here. So it allows any consumer of Bestcom in the area that we have uh, covered to log in to the tool using their Bestcom account ID. They have to just fill in a few of the details here and log in. It's an OTP based system where the OTP goes directly to your mail and you use that to enter the site. So what this tool allows any consumer to do is first it goes into an area which is near the person's uh, location and if they identify the rooftop by saying that this is so it's like uber or any location based specific app that anybody uses now so if they say that this is my location so the map loads up like a five centimeter resolution as you can see the images that will load up are five times higher in resolution and accuracy than Google Earth or Google Maps. So if we say that, okay, this is my rooftop here. And I want to assess the feasibility of installing rooftop solar on this roof. And we click on yes. Just a second, that was not in the zone that we checked. So if you want to search for your exact location, we can do that as well. So we look at, so it goes straight to the location that you wanted to check. 
using the search bar and then you can go and find out what is your exact solar potential on this place. So you can choose exactly which of the rooftop area that you want to select can be chosen for rooftop. So as you can see, although this obstacle creates a bit of shadow on this, we can still see it's a big area. So we say, we choose this polygon and we say yes. And it shows you the electricity consumption for your 12 months. So this is the data that we get from Bestcom. But if you see the load is quite less because, and you can install a lot of solar, but as of now, the policy is that you cannot install more than your sanction load. So what the tool does is it finds out exactly the least amount of solar panels that you can install on a rooftop and get the maximum savings out of it. So based on this, we can see that you can install only one kilowatt and we can get because of your uh, low consumption, you can use only one kilowatt and reach your consumption. And that means that as Hande sir said, it's the demand which matters and not the total supply. So with one kilowatt, you can completely offset your electricity consumption. And although this is not a very suitable proposition for a single developer for whom one kilowatt will be a small ticket size, but if you aggregate all of these possible consumers, our tool shows that there are around three lakh buildings with the one to 10 kilowatt range and the total capacity that you can install there is more than 1.2 gigawatts which is the target for Bestcom. So once you have this information ready with all of the developers and with the distribution company, it's very easy for them to call a tender. And then the developer doesn't have to deal with a one kilowatt system, but he has a demand of 200 megawatts across the whole city. So then it becomes cost competitive and it also allows even smaller ticket sizes to access renewable energy and thereby become proud owners of rooftop systems. Apart from this, what we can see is that now the state is focused a lot on solar in agriculture. Already 72% of the dedicated feeders, agricultural feeders are being planned for solar because it's a 10 gigawatt program, which is being promoted by the state. So for that, what we try to do is we saw today that solar as in the dedicated feeders in the state are being supplied for seven hours every day which is three hours during the day and four hours during the night or vice versa. But the problem there is that the farmers have to keep their pumps on for a long time because it's difficult for them to travel back and forth from the fields late at night when the power is there. So if you look at the whole concept of demand being the driver for RE, we see that the seven hours of power that any feeder requires can be supplied throughout the day with solar power and at a cost less than what the government is paying. So the government is now paying around 11,000 crores annually to offset the free electricity consumption in the agricultural sector. So if you have solar power to supply all of these feeders, then it becomes a much more feasible solution because you don't need to balance, you don't need to do any scheduling because the power which is generated from solar in the small site there goes directly in feeding the uh, feeders. So the design is that we set up a smaller plant on the lower side of the transform of the subscation and we directly feed seven hours during the day. So what this tool allows us to do is that if the Karnataka is planning for a 10 gigawatt uh, solar for agriculture scheme from the PM Kusum and the other options, then it is easy to just identify smaller parcels of land which are readily available and install solar plants there. And it can also increase the opportunity of local farmers to invest through different financing schemes in solar. So we found out that the total load requirement to replace all uh, feeders with solar is around 11 gigawatts. And you can install three and a half gigawatts easily without improving or upgrading any infrastructure. But if the state goes for a 10, kilo, 10 gigawatt program, they can use our tool, which we've uh, submitted to the energy department last year. And we can see that this tool, what it allows us to do is it allows us to go to any DISCOM. For example, we'll take the Mysore DISCOM and we choose any of these substations. So we'll try and see one which has a lot of these dedicated agricultural feeders. 
So you can identify this. As you can see, there are some agricultural and non-agricultural feeders coming out of this subscation. And it also tells us what are the IP sets connected, what is the load which is connected, and what are the solar pl power plants and the capacities that are required to feed these feeders. So for this particular subscation and the feeders, you have a multiple sites of solar which are identified, smaller ones. So as you can see, you can put anywhere between 1.7 to 8.9 megawatts to supply each of these agricultural feeders here. So all of the sites are available. So if the uh, energy department or credible or KPCL or anybody wants to look at dedicated feeders supplied by solar in a more focused way, then our tool is available for them to identify all suitable plant size, uh, plant sizes and locations. So this kind of planning approaches always help in deciding where the solar plants will come up, what will be the impact on the low grid, if any, because then you have to figure out load flows to see if the frequency and the voltage are matching. And once we can do this kind of work, we see that the demand is being supplied purely by solar without any need for any other interventions. So the analysis that we did said that if you supply all of these dedicated feeders with solar, that 88% of the year you're supplying it with solar and only 12% of the year you're taking electricity from the grid. So once you have that kind of uh, analysis done and ready for use, it becomes so much more easier to plan and the decentralized RE along with rooftop and with agricultural feeders along with Andesar's extremely innovative last end and then last mile connectivity with RE, that becomes more of a reality. And we believe at CSCAP that that is the way forward. Of course, large plants need to play a major role in increasing the installed capacity and reaching our targets. But the best way to go forward with RE is to have these decentralized systems. That could be all from my side. I'll take questions as and when they are thrown at me. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shaptak. And this is more like magic, you know, the, the website that you showed and how it was zooming in on a rooftop and one can find the potential. And, you know, we've heard about it before, but thank you for taking us uh, through this. Clearly, you know, what you have also clarified is that big is not the best. And that is what everybody has said so far as mm -hmm. well. But let's, uh, you know, come back to some of the questions. There are questions in the co comment box on uh, assessing RE potential also in view of biodiversity impacts and, you know, maybe yes. going forward, all these conversations will come up. There is also a question on how decentralized has a role to play when extreme weather events strike and Harish alluded to it a little bit on, you know, the, the COVID situation and how DRE was an answer, but maybe, you know, address those questions as, as, as you go along as well. Uh, we now, uh, go to our last speaker uh, for the day, uh, not at all the least, uh, Ashok uh, from WRI. And uh, may I invite you, Ashok, to talk about the work that you have done and what is it that you want to present today with respect to you know, the state of uh, solar in Karnataka, but especially the work that you have done also on decentralized. Ashok, we can see your slide, but we can't hear you. Do you want to check your audio? Can't hear you yet. Ashok? Ashok, you're muted. Yes. Yeah, no, no. yeah now you're fine. Just took me a moment. Uh, there is a problem with your microphone, I think. It's getting cut in the middle. Is I think better? now it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. let's go with this. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm afraid I think it's coming and going a little bit. Do you want to try now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, you can start. Okay, so I will uh, try my best. Uh, Probably if there are still problems, you can tell me. Can I double check? Are you speaking directly into the computer? Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe speak slowly for a little while so that the sound remains consistent. Let's test. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Uh, apologies uh, for this uh, technical uh, glitches. Um, the previous speakers, especially Mr. Harish and uh, Hassan Saptar, uh, they've all covered very uh, you know, pertinent and interesting issues about you know, the developmental uh, side of renewable energy and then how you enable consumers uh, with the design of solar investments and all of that. Um, we at WRI, we have been, uh, I'm afraid I may come off as this uh, corporate greedy guy who is uh, supporting the large corporations uh, transition to clean energy, but uh, essentially that's uh, one problem we have been working on uh, for the last uh, seven, eight years at WRI India that energy program. Uh, but uh, the reason we started working with large corporations is uh, primarily uh, uh, it was uh, a little easier to nudge uh, you know, these corporations uh, with the ability to invest and their, uh, their, their the affinity for sustainability in their uh, energy. Right? Uh, but for the last uh, one and a half to two years, we have uh, uh, sort of transitioned to a phase where we said, you know, uh, whatever little gains in renewable energy that you have done, uh, with only working with corporates uh, is over now because we are hit, we are buzzing at the seams, and right now we need to work with utilities and with firms uh, to be able to scale up this solution. Um, so before I go into uh, you know some snippets of research that we're working on of it right now, I just quickly wanted to draw uh, the attention of the audience to this uh, one central element of uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. And if you look at the, uh, are my slides visible? Yes, yes, yes. The first one, the right. CNI. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, it's. Uh, Essentially, we've just charted uh, the installations, the consumption uh, across various categories of consumers and how much revenue they are contributing to SCOM. Uh, and you would see that uh, even though they are only consuming about 30% of uh, the electricity and this was simply the numbers, uh, the key message we want to drive home is that they're contributing more than what they're consuming. And this is across the year. Um, this is fundamentally because uh, as most of you would know because in India we have this concept of cross subsidization of electricity uh, where we have decided the commercial and industrial consumers to pay higher tariffs um, to fill in the gap uh, that comes in because of the in some cases the residential consumers. This is, this is the reason why we have this, um, you know. I will now go to the next slide. So, uh, like I said, they. So, they, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, participants are having difficulty listening. Do you want to try once with the earphone on again? I will try once. Yeah. Thanks. Um, is this? Better? Yeah, let's go. Let's okay. go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, like I said, um, the commercial and industrial consumers uh, plug in the deficit of renewable because of other categories of consumers. And why is this important? Right? Uh, this is important. Like one, one could say, okay, what is in it for me? I'm a resident of India. Uh, you know, that is the way it is. Uh, but uh, you would see that as the cost of renewable energy is coming down uh, over the last two, three years, you can see that the, on the y-axis you will see the consumption, uh, these consumers are opting for various other sources of the large consumers. So they're setting up their own captive power plants, they're uh, purchasing uh, renewable energy through wheeling agreements, uh, they're uh, setting up their own open access power plants as well. And uh, this essentially uh, means two things that BESCOM for BESCOM or other ESCOMs, they're losing their biggest uh, tariff claim domain. And 
where would they recover that cost from? Uh, these are the same uh, consumers who were going to cross us for your access. So uh, for the financial help of BISCOM, uh, and which as a corollary for the financial help uh, of the other, um, rather the tariff implications on other consumers, we need to make sure that uh, it forms uh, future-proof their business. Uh, they need to retain these consumers. Uh, there is one other radical argument that one could make that if they want to uh, let go of these consumers, let them go away, then uh, what are the problems? Is there are two three problems that come up. Uh, so one again, uh, like I said, because the large consumers are participating in the supply, uh, the proportionate sales uh, for Bestcom are going down. Actually, you see over the last few years. Um, why is this important? Like I said, we already have excess uh, power. Uh, I think other speakers have already highlighted this, and our uh, you know colleagues from Bestcom they have highlighted how. Uh, we already have excess power, and if this excess, when you have uh, too much of renewable energy coming in, you have to uh, sort of uh, shut down the thermal power plants. And when you do that, you're obviously paying them a cost. Not only are you not consuming electricity for them, you are still paying them some cost associated with it. All of this adds up to the cost, which doesn't help anybody. So we need to avoid these capacities which are uh, not used, but at the same time we need to also ensure that uh, financially uh, there is no burden either on this form, because if there is burden on this form, it has to be resolved uh, whether the commercial and industrial or agricultural categories. So a long story cut short, um, because the other elements of how this could be tackled are covered by this form. Uh, one way of doing this is uh, decentralization. Um, SCOM is planning to set up a water without a rooftop solar power plant on the consumer's premises. Uh, I'll, this slide talks about that. But the other things uh, that they're trying to do uh, are uh, you know, the solar and wind energy hybrids, which was to manage the variability of uh, solar alone or wind alone and increase the PLF of the transport. To pass on the uh, idling cost of transmission and stuff like this to the consumer. And the other thing is uh, also pumped hydro. Uh, pumped hydro, again, uh, uh, there are benefits in terms of electricity supply and demand that are easy to manage, but we will have to be a little also cognizant of the environmental uh, impact that the panel highlighted and it's never a simple uh, um, but uh, one uh, aspect that we're trying to tackle here coming back to the question here is uh, how how can our best form retain this commercial and industry consumers so you see this graph uh, the the blue uh, blue bars are what best form right now charges these consumers and uh, the landed uh, cost of other options what these consumers are able to do in a private market. So uh, because solar rooftops uh, have become so cheap right now, uh, we are running simulations to see what if Bescom themselves invest in these rooftops. Uh, and uh, essentially, if you see the cost of solar, uh, you could say is uh, around 3.5 rupees. Bescom's own uh, tariff for gross metering will be around 3 rupees. So the difference between this uh, 3.5 rupees to 6.5 rupees is what Bescom can get uh, as a uh, profit margin when they then will invest in these consumers. And hence, uh, can use that as a way to shore up the losses uh, and also retain these consumers from moving away from their, from their supply. So this is some of the work that we are trying to do. Yeah, that's it. I hope uh, this was. Yes, we know. had, uh, I must say, it uh, needed some concentration because the sound was coming and going. But uh, I think the points at least have been well taken, Ashok. Uh, we will come to some of the, you know, the, the, the points that you made as there is more discussion. 
maybe at this point uh, i will open the floor and include some of the comments and uh, reflections that have been made in the q and a section and uh, we can have some of you to be addressing uh, you know the the points there and uh, clearly uh, i think the yeah one question uh, not really a question uh, specifically over there but i think one question that comes to mind listening uh, all of you and also uh, listening bescom and kpcl uh, it, it feels that uh, you know uh, especially at an international climate diplomacy level india makes a lot of effort to talk about things like it's not doing any further coal but at the same time there is a huge push for example to further coal mine auctions as part of covid recovery also uh, you know despite uh, stranded asset uh, problem again uh, putting uh, some of the coal plants uh, giving them a new lease of life so to say and uh, i'm not sure uh, you know if the speaker from the government is still there uh, but if he if he is here i i think it would have been useful to understand how to situate the big message on energy transition especially for karnataka at a point where next week uh, as some of us are aware there is a big international conference happening uh, on called the powering past coal alliance i will share the link here in the chat in a while but essentially um, it will seek participation also from the indian government and i think uh, somebody senior from the ministry of power will participate largely there will be uh, you know grandstanding statements on how india is moving away from coal and uh, at this juncture it felt that it might be just you know good for journalists who are looking uh, at this from a from a new story point of view to look at how everything that is happening in terms of uh, coal expansion in some states is getting just opposed with how india will internationally uh, participate in powering past coal but long and short i think the statements that were made by the speaker from the government were quite important in at least bringing out how karnataka is moving away from coal and that is a positive message uh, certainly to highlight i will paste the link in chat but going back to some of the questions and clarifications that people had any one of you shoptak and harish if you want to handle you know the whole thing of how dre is also meant for disaster events and disaster management i think there are several examples that have been documented but for the benefit of uh, some of the reporters present here do you want to talk about how uh, decentralized is the actual powerful thing when monsoon floods happen or when covid happened and harish you spoke about it so a little more detail on that if you can give yeah uh, thanks uh... Uh, I, I to to also there's a question from Monica which I said I'll answer live, uh, and uh, so there are two parts. One is in a disaster, or 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 if you look at uh, it's related to also Monica that question of you, yours. Uh, what happens in the disaster zone is, and if you look at uh, during the COVID times, um, one was the easiest was the energy health nexus. So the, today we have the the way we have to look at decentralized energy or energy. is how do we institutionalize sustainability into other sectors it's not about solar panels or coal fired plants it's about better health better education better livelihood that's what the end goal is always so why do you have electricity or energy for a some goal if we are able to institutionalize sustainability into the delivery of health education livelihoods you democratize those deliveries what do we need that every poor person every person needs to have access to health access to education and livelihoods and this is exactly where a country becomes socially and financially sustainable and that's why dre plays a role if you look at remoteness remote schools or or even in disaster areas can you put up a maternal labor room within 10 minutes yes you have sustainable panels in terms of uh, building you have uh, uh, high efficient baby warmers and uh, and and autoclaves using solar you power it and within half an hour you are set up similarly in the covid situation what has happened is put up decentralized cold storages for vegetables to be stored so that you could create a market within 50 kilometers for people to actually sell it without the vegetables getting perishable so there are numerous such examples that actually the the link between covid and energy and the and the link between disaster and energy what happens is 
disaster pushes innovation how can i create the most high efficient refrigerator or an autoclave or a dental chair anything else that leads that could be then be used by the other parts of the population during normal time it's all the moon shots the use of solar panels in satellites or the subsidization of the internet by the us military led to common services of internet to any every, everybody else disaster actually pushes innovation to happen so monica your other question that relating should the poor no it's actually let's look at sustainable energy in a positive it is valid in three cases solar is valid in three cases one where there's no electricity absolutely no energy supply makes sense second when there's unreliable electricity yes and and when electricity is super reliable solar is more economically viable because if you have to make electricity is super reliable it becomes super expensive like in maharashtra again solar winds so in all three cases where there's no electricity when there's unreliable electricity or where there's reliable electricity solar actually wins so for many of the poor actually they they not only have electricity to increase their livelihoods during electricity cut but they save on electricity when the electricity is there so it's not the question and plus the 40% of the world's population the poor will reinnovate high efficient coal storages for the poor will lead to a different type of cooling for the for the middle class and the rich the the type of dental chairs will relook at efficient dental chairs for the middle class is the poor who are actually showcasing how innovation will happen and sustainability is that platform it's not vice versa this is a beauty of sustainable energy and poverty that where innovations will be bottom up where the middle class and upper middle class will have to adapt to be socially sustainable arthi thanks thanks harish uh, all uh, useful comments i have to keep going i will wrap this up in 2 to 3 minutes because we also have some other uh, 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 updates that joydeep has to give but one question that has come up now and brief if somebody can address it maybe shoptak you want to pick this up that's really about how you know uh, the uh, i mean uh, when we are talking about large scale solar or when we talking about solar in general there is a, a climate justice angle as well there are stories in rajasthan on how you know the pastoral communities are getting delineated is there anything that you want to talk about what this means to you know the the basic issue of land rights and the uh, and the communities who have been living there as solar expands but also the second part of the question quite unrelated is i saw in comments uh, there is some more update that is needed on what kind of a system you are using for your uh, you know the your web tool on tracking uh, the solar potential so maybe just you know either uh, inform or uh, uh, you can address that later as well but there was interest in something you said about this better than google and uh, there was a question on what exactly is the tool that you are using or what backend you are using but address that briefly thanks so uh, to begin with as I, i personally and as a organization we think that as re grows more and more the demand especially with this government there's all, always a demand for the large plants because the cost has come down to around 2 rupees a unit keeps fluctuating but that's the rough number and when you have uh, economics like that it makes a lot of sense to increase the installed capacity which means you need more and more land and i uh, rightly said there are a lot of these uh, social justice issues which are coming up because uh, wastelands are never wasteland because there's always some sort of uh, activity going on whether it's grazing or whether it's uh, local livelihoods so what we found out after doing the karnataka study is that there are other organizations like the foundation for ecological security uh, vasudha foundation and the nature conservancy who are actually looking very very uh, deeply into these issues so we are partnered with them now so they have developed a site a tool called the site right tool the site right tool uses our technical data and the layers that we have done in our ari atlas they combine it with the ecological and the social impact layers that they have developed so they actually uh, go to all the possible sites and they find out if there are any livelihood associated or any animal based uh, activity going on so if indeed the sites which you identify have such things going on then they mark it and even with those even if you so the analysis shows that even if you exclude those lands there are plenty of other lands which are available for re development and now uh, we had a the tool was launched uh, somewhere two months back and there you've uh, got so what we're trying to do is we're trying to engage the largest financial institutions the largest developers 
policy makers would like at the highest level to ensure that this planning for re becomes more inclusive and that there is no displacement there are no conflicts so the tool is already live and running for madhya pradesh and we're developing it for other states like uh, rajasthan karnataka and maharashtra for the time being so yes while this issue is bound to come up we are doing what we can to ensure that these conflicts will not arise in the future when the demand for land increases manifold a second part of the question with respect to the tool that we use uh, as i said we uh, flew the helicopter with the light detection and ranging camera the lidar camera so the images that we capture got three times more in terms of resolution when it comes to google so you can zoom in three times more compared to any google apps where it's maps or earth and it will not get pixelated plus we have reconstructed the city in the form of points so there are 20 to 30 points per square meter and the whole city is now in the 3d format so what that essentially means that at a 5 cm resolution each rooftop has been reconstructed and all the obstacles the trees and the poles and the advertisement hoardings or your neighboring buildings the shadow cast from each of these obstacles on each particular roof has been calculated over 365 days and the simulation that we provide takes into account all of these calculations so any consumer who is using our tool which is the c steps rooftop evaluation for solar tool crest gets access to this kind of information for free and this tool allows a consumer to log in with their id and based on their consumption detail find out what is the best size solar system for them and if if our design does not suit them if the design shows that the rooftop should uh, solar should be installed in a particular place which has been earmarked for some other activity the user can now customize it and select any other space on the rooftop and see if it is viable or not so these calculations are already done in our backend and the tool is hosted on our server and it's also available on bestcom server as well thank you shoptak for answering this in a lot of detail i also saw that you had answered those questions in writing so sorry some of this was repetition but uh, uh, i think i will wrap up the discussion at this moment and i think uh, uh, yeah i will let uh, joydeep take on from here but at least from all of the statements that came and the perspectives that were shared it's you, you know it's it's pretty clear that there is a big benefit that karnataka has taken with some of the positive renewable policies that have come forward and clearly also it's one of those states which will continue to hold that position of being progressive as india tries to figure out what the bigger energy transition story is like thanks very much for listening into the moderated discussion uh, for now over to you joydeep for the next updates Thank you very much, Arthi, for uh, moderating it so well, uh, and thanks to all the speakers for the excellent presentations and discussion uh, from all participants. Now, as I said in the beginning, this is a media workshop. So, as journalists, our question, next question, is where do I go from here? How do I take this forward? All that I've heard today, and that is what I want to bring to your attention. please look at the chat box right uh, and you don't have to click on that right now i'll show you i'll share that uh, website with you right now uh, and uh, basically there there is a set of story grant opportunities on re in india available as of right now okay from the earth journalism network so we heard a lot of story things today that give us story ideas at least it has given me some story ideas definitely and i think it it would have given story ideas to some of you uh, i'm i'm sure fixed charges for coal being a big problem demand not picking up as expected uh, new karnataka ari policy encouraging solar wind the parks the solar parks floating solar dre 20 megawatts per taluka what does it mean what does it do how much stranded coal capacity we have in india now and then the various tools that shoptok showed what can you do with transmission infrastructure that's lying idle the possibilities of taking crest to other cities and the, then the big big story uh, 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 problem things like is there too much power in the country today that that that's a big question and i think it would be ex 
if economic journalists looked at it in more detail than they're looking at it now? Is it because we have overproduction? Is it because we have under demand? If we have under demand, why do we have under demand? Is it because of purchasing power issues? What What's the problem? And I think these are important story ideas and we'll be very happy to support them. So we are offering grants to boost reporting on renewable energy in India. We have a particular focus on three states because these are big states in terms of RE in the country. Karnataka, of course, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. But applications are welcome from journalists all over India about renewable energy in all states, all UTs. But applications from these three states and especially from Karnataka will be given preference. Okay. Now, I want to tell you one or two very small logistical things about it. All of you are eligible. So um, all of you who are journalists who are, are totally eligible. But uh, going through the applications in the past has shown me one thing that I should in possibly mention here, because some of you get this wrong. There is one question there saying, what are your distribution channels? And people don't figure out that we are, we are asking for is, where will you publish or which which TV station will you broadcast or which newspaper or which website will you publish in? So uh, that is what we mean by that. So go ahead with RE story ideas and, and to do, do with RE. And another important point I wanted to mention here is that like all reporters like me, I'm sure that you are hap very happy to be doing story ideas that point out problems. We are also very happy to be taking story ideas that point out problems, but we are even happier to be taking story ideas that point out solutions, especially replicable solutions. The kind of solutions Harish talked about today, I think, is very exciting for stories from not just from Karnatak, stories from Orissa, stories from Manipur, stories from anywhere else. Harish has very kindly put his email uh, in the chat box. Ask him if, if there, if suppose you are a reporter sitting in Uttar Pradesh, ask him, is there some somewhere in Uttar Pradesh you could do the same same kind of story? If you are in uh, in Rajasthan, can you do the same kind of story from Rajasthan? So go for it. Get back to me if you have any questions on this. And remember, please, and this is not flexible because the software will not accept. Please remember the deadline, 15th of March, 5 o'clock in the evening. Thank you very much. Aarti, back to you. Chaidip, I think we've wrapped up the discussion, unless there are any further questions. I so, don't see any further questions. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. OK. Uh, I then think it's in, a good point to wrap up then. OK, thanks. Thank you. Thanks again to all the speakers. Thank They've been you. excellent and very helpful. We have requested all the speakers to share their slides. As soon as they do so, we shall share the slides with all participants. Uh, and the recording of this will be put on our website very soon. And we shall share the link with all participants and all panelists. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.